Today I'm going to look at the topic of history. Now when we look at history from an anthropological perspective, we have to distinguish what happened in the past with history, which is culturally meaningful ways of constructing the past. There's a, we have a kind of naive assumption when we're children that history is what happened in the past. But what anthropologists teach us is that different cultures make the past meaningful in different ways. And that's what history means. And furthermore, anthropologists would suggest the controversial idea that we can never really know what happened in the past. We can only construct it in certain ways. And that is what history is. A social construction of the past. Um, now, within uh, different cultures, there are different ideas of history. Uh, one idea I wanted to talk about first is the Christian ideas in Europe, in let's say the uh, medieval to early modern period, let's say 500 to 1700. And the basic idea of history was that there were three epochs. Um, there was an initial bliss, that is the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. There was the fall from grace where God condemned Adam and Eve to have to work for a living and thus humans like us and our wait for salvation. We're, we're waiting for uh, the coming of the Messiah to uh, redeem our sins, to redeem our sins. So this was a very important idea the, uh, which Christian ideas of history had in the medieval period because they taught us that we were born in sin and that was only through the intermediary of the Catholic Church that one could attain uh, redemption and entry into heaven. So this idea of history was very important for the Catholic Church maintaining power. So it's thus not surprising, it's thus not surprising um, that anthropologists often tell us, often tell us that history is linked with power. And in this case, it's the power of the Catholic Church. Now, from about the 1700s in European history, a new idea of history developed, and these were the so-called teleological ideas. Now, the term teleology, the term teleology, comes uh, from, for example, Aristotle, who said, uh, "An acorn grows into what? Guess, an oak tree. An acorn grows into an oak tree. Acorn to." oak tree. In other words, uh, everything has a, a final end point to which it's travelling. So in the case of uh, history, it was thought that history was developing towards an end point. Now these ideas were popular uh, in relation to the late Enlightenment. If you think of the Enlightenment, that's the period of the encyclopedists in France in the 1700s and associated with great think thinkers such as Rousseau in England and Hume and Locke in Britain. Um, so the ideas of evolution were various. Uh, they developed, as I suggested, partly from the late Enlightenment. They're strongly associated with Victorian Britain. There was a sense amongst um, people in England that they were the most advanced society in the world. They felt they were the most advanced society in the world. The other thing was that the growth of the new fields of archaeology and geology suggested to these Victorians that the world was far older than they had ever imagined. I think uh, theologists prior to this would have told us that the world was a few thousand years old. Then it started getting backdated to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions and hundreds of millions of years. The other idea th which helped the um, promotion of the idea of teleology, that is evolution, and that, that humans have, are evolving through history to being better, was the discovery of the so-called Aryan languages. The 
was discovered in this period that different um, languages were linked up. So, if, for example, in Sanskrit, the word for two is dui. In um, Italian, let's say it's duo. And in German, it's fi. And in English, as we know, it's two. And these sounds are connected. I think it's a, a heart, a voiced or unvoiced t, d sound followed by the semi vowel w, and then a vowel such as, sorry, semi, sorry, two consonants. First consonant would be t or d. Next consonant would be a, uh, so next would be a semi vowel, u or w, and then i, u or u. So du, zwei, dwi, tu are all kind of related. So there's an idea that societies uh, had evolved from a certain starting point. This all led people to start to question the idea of a fall from grace and instead to replace that with an idea of historical evolution. So when we go back to the Enlightenment we see Burnett saying that um, languages evolved from a single origin, that is like the Aryan languages, and they also evolved um, from simple to a monosyllabic to polysyllabic to vowel simple to vowel rich words from vowel simple to vowel rich words so monosyllabic to polysyllabic from vowel uh, reduced to vowel rich words and this was the thinking in the 1770s Comte who was an early sociologist suggested that human um, thinking has evolved from a theological stage to a metaphysical stage to a positivist stage Spencer, who was the guy who was responsible for, ide uh, for ideas like survival of the fittest and natural se selection and evolution, said that, that um, species evolved from simple to complex, from homogenous to heterogeneous. Now the biggest thinkers associated with this are Darwin and Marx. Darwin, as we know, suggested that there was evolution. Now this has been misinterpreted as uh, people think that humans evolved from apes and this is not the case. In fact, humans and apes have the same ancestors and there's no idea that contemporary humans are in any way superior to our ancestors. We just differently evolved, differently um, suited to different environments. Marx, as we know, suggested there was an evolution and you can see this in another one of my concepts in anthropology. There was an evolution from uh, primitive communism to the classical age of slave societies to the feudal age to the modern age and then he predicted that we would go to a socialist and finally a communist um, stage in history and these ideas also came through in Whig histories and the probably what my favorite Whig historian is Winston Churchill who saw classical civilization as a period of growth of development, that the medieval period was a period of stagnation, and then the growth of society was revivified or reborn during the Renaissance and then the Reformation. So he saw, for example, in English history, the development of democracy, the development of legal institutions, etc., as a development. So, in other words, history, the teleo teleological idea of history, sees history. At as an evolution, as a development towards a certain end, and misuses thinkers such as Darwin to say that um, humans are, are more advanced than their predecessors. In fact, there's no more advanced or less advanced in Darwinism, but there is in social Darwinism, that is when Darwin's ideas are misappropriated by others. Okay, um, I'll skip the next slide. After the 1970s, uh, postmodernism, postmodernism, and poststructuralism begin to question the idea of history. Uh, there are various ways of looking at this. One one account said that history is basically his story. In other words, it's a male account of the past that justifies patriarchy. In other words, um, the, if we think about weak history, another idea often there was the great man in history, the idea of the great man in history, that there were, there were men that would change history. In other words, um, history was used to justify the control of men over women. Postmodernism rather argued that there are different histories and saw so myth, and so history is basically a, a form of myth, like the Greeks have myth, we have our myths, 
and they take the form of history, things we assume to be real but actually cover up power relations. The postmodern post-structuralist uh, critique also said tradition as we know it is basically an invention. All the traditions we know are invented to re-establish power relations. And the famous idea of invented tradition was about the kilts in Scotland. It was said the kilts weren't really Scottish. They were basically an English invention to I don't know, justify or legitimise English control in Scotland. Further thinkers such as Wolfe and Mintz said that the economic modernisation of the West has always been closely linked to the colonisation of the rest. In other words, the rest of the world um, was colonised at precisely the time that modernity um, appears. From about 1500 on, the rest of the world is colonised and European moderni modernity begins. And following up on that, uh, modern and traditional economies have been inextricably linked. In other words, you can't really have a modern without a traditional. The traditional was created by the modern. So to take another example, in 19th century Java, there was a cash export co economy of things like tea, sugar, coffee. And this piggybacked, if you like, on a subsistence economy. And what that means is that the peasants would work on their own rice fields for their own subsistence part of the year, and part of the year they were forced to work on plantations to produce cash crops like tea, coffee and sugar for export back to Europe. And in this way, traditional and modern have been created at the same time. Okay. Postmodernism also critiques then the whole idea of modernity. In other words, uh, postmodernism tells us that distinguishing the modern and the traditional is difficult. Okay, so basically what I've done in this little presentation is to distinguish three different ways of looking at history. One is the idea of um, initial bliss, fall from grace, and then the wait for salvation. The other was the teleological idea of history, of development, or progress, or advancement. And the final one was the postmodern idea of history, which is one of different histories, and histories covering up uh, power relations. Um, I have to say that the approach taken in my history of histories is pretty much a postmodern one. It's very strongly influenced by postmodernism. I see history as social, socially constructed, and thus one could critique my own presentation, saying, "Well, that's just a, what I've just said is a social construction itself." I hope it's of more value than just that, but maybe it isn't. So, thank you for your attention. If you have any comments or questions, you can contact me at on Twitter at N Herriman. Thank you very much.